of the things Pat's reading of the account of Palm Sunday from the book of John is that those who gathered, as you heard, they came because Lazarus, because of the miracles that he had done. It wasn't genuine faith that they had. Because he said, if you believed in me, you would believe in the Father. He was exposing them for the people that they were. There were a lot of people who proclaimed faith in Jesus, but most did not have saving faith in Jesus. This brings us to our question this morning. Will Jesus find faith in the earth when he returns? Will he find faith in the earth when he returns? The meaning of faith that pleases God has been so perverted that its true meaning is scoffed at. People will say you're looking for the sweet by and by. And that you're so, earth, you're so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. I've heard that saying many times, so earthly minded, so heavenly minded, no earthly good. The reality is only those who are heavenly minded are truly of any earthly good. Because those who are heavenly minded are looking forward to the coming of their Savior. They love God and they love fellow believers and the world at large. I heard one preacher say that those who focus on doctrine love God and have a knowledge of God, but they don't know how to love people. Well, according to his definition of love is that you never speak against another believer. But we see in the book of Jude that we are to contend for the faith once for all handed down to the saints. Because my parents loved me, they told the truth about me and they corrected all the things that needed to be corrected swiftly. And uh, I don't want to go there. I'm sorry. It's, Amen. The old song says, precious memories, how they linger. I don't know how precious the memory is, but some things sure do linger. <laughs> there is a vast chasm between the faith Jesus taught and the bastardized faith being preached today. Narcissistic, narcissistic faith focuses on human desire. God-pleasing faith focuses on accomplishing the will of God. There's a lot of narcissistic faith running around today. Oh, believing for this, believe for that, believe for this, believe for the house. Everything's going to turn out exactly the way I want it. You just got to name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. But that's not saving faith. That is not the faith that pleases God. Let's turn to Luke 18 verse 1 as we answer the question, will Jesus find faith in the earth when he returns. Luke 18 verse 1 says, Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. Verse 2 saying, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect men. We learn from this passage that prayer is an act of faith and obedience whereby we express our total dependence upon God and confidence in his ability alone to change that which cannot ch we cannot change, especially when we're dealing with wicked people. You ever have to deal with wicked people at work or, or somewhere and you try hard to change them and the more you try to change them, the worse it gets. So what do we do? We submit ourselves to the will of God and it is God's will that we pray and not be that we should pray all the time and not lose heart. If you don't want to lose heart, pray. If you want to lose heart, try to change him. Amen. It is this faith that pleases God and keeps us in perfect peace as we keep our minds stayed upon him. Prayer helps us to keep our minds stayed upon him. Christ upon God and is an expression of our faith. Verse three, there was a widow in that city, as he continued, and she kept coming to him, meaning the evil judge, saying, give me legal protection from my opponent. How many times do we see the righteous going to evil judges trying to get justice and it never happens? It just doesn't happen. It seems like David said in Psalm 37, why does it seem like the wicked always prosper and, and, and the little guy just seems to get the short end of the stick? Why? Why? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it because God said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. 
So if he's going to take vengeance, you want him to do it in his time. Because when he does it, it's going to be something, something, something. Amen. And the good thing, you're going to be there to see it. Not that we wish bad on the wicked. We want, as before that time, we want the wicked to be saved. But there's going to come a time, as said in the book of Revelation, let him that is guilty be guilty still. Let him who is wicked be wicked still. Let him who is righteous be righteous still. It's going to all be over. And God's going to take care of everybody according to what they have done. Amen. Persistent prayer is one of the marks of a true believer, especially in the face of great opposition. Only those who are persistent in prayer endure to the end and will see the justice of God. Prayer. Well, well how do I pray? Open your mouth and talk to God. Just open your mouth and talk to God. I grew up in a church where the elders, they would wear black suits and white shirts and black ties and they had a special prayer language. You see them talking over here. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> and then we get up to pray. Oh, God of the universe. I'm like, <laughs> I can't pray like that. Just open your mouth. The way you would talk to me, talk to God. Tell him, God, open your mouth. We got, it says, within your bosom, you have a phone. Where you walk, you're not walking alone. Remember, God is still on the throne. Open up your mouth and pray to your Abba Father. Like the dependent child you are. Verse 4, Luke 18. For a while he was unwilling, talking about the, evil, the wicked judge. But afterward, he said to himself, <laughs> Even though I don't fear God nor respect man, verse 5, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. <laughs> Squeaky wheel. <laughs> she became fingernails on the chalkboard. The wicked... Do not do what is right because it pleases God. Let me say that again. The wicked do not do what is right because it pleases God. They do it because it benefits them. So they won't go. To, why do they do it? What do you mean? So they won't go to jail. They won't have to pay a fine or they don't want to lose respect to the community. You see, we think that the good things people do, we think, well, they must be going to heaven. They don't, you know, they don't cuss. They don't chew. They don't hang out with, they don't do all these things. They don't eat, cat, drink caffeine. They're a nice person in the community. And the reason why people, most people don't go to jail is not for the glory of God. is because they don't want to be inconvenienced in their life. It's not about God. I don't care. You hear all these actors raising money for this cause and building this school and the world goes, oh, well, this is wonderful. This is great. Yeah, it's great for a temporary time. But in reality, that school and all they're in are going to burn up. Amen. If it, it, so this is why we preach the gospel. It is the only message that gets people off the sinking Titanic into the ark of safety, who is Jesus Christ, our Lord. God only does what is right because there is no sin in right. And he defines right. He's always right. Therefore, all of his judgments are right. Amen. His judgments are right. Why? Because he is right. Because just think about, just think about it. Who created God? No one. I'm sorry. I just got a brain freeze. Where did he come from? He came from himself. <laughs> so if you are the source of your own being, anything you decide is right. Right? God is God not because we declare him to be God. God is God because he's God. And so whatever he says goes. But churches today want to have, they want to have conversation with our brethren who hate God and want to see how we can coexist together in the presence of God. That is the operation in folly and foolishness. 
There is no church apart from believers who love and obey God. The church of God obeys God, loves God, walks in the statutes of God, and glorify God in their bodies in every aspect. Amen. Amen. Verse 6, Luke 18, And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous does, judge said, meaning, here's the point, verse 7. Now, Will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. What's taking so long for Jesus to come? Why? Because he said, I want to save all my sheep. I want to make sure all of them. Some of my sheep were born in 1845. Some of my sheep were born in 1959. Let me know if I hit your year. Some were born in 1962, 42. Anyone? No, it's none of my business. Some of them were born. Some will be born in the year 2012, whatever. But he's going to make sure that all of his sheep get into the fold. Amen. So the point is, God is it's not going to take him long to do what he's called to do. Like I said, lightning strikes real quick. You want to see some damage? Look at a house hit by lightning. Doesn't take all day. And when the judgment of God is released, it's going to hit like pow. It says the, ele the elements will melt away. The elements will melt away, Peter says. It's going to be a great and terrible day as the, as the Bible describes. We discussed, they said, we talked about this uh, a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago. You can be assured the end will come and God will take vengeance on all his enemies and bring about justice for his elect. You can be sure. Verse 8. I tell you that he will bring, this is how we know Jesus said it. Verse 8. I tell you that he will bring about justice for them, his elect, quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, the question has been asked. Will he find faith on the earth? The answer is yes. If not, we're in trouble. But, there's a caveat. It will be scarce. Scarce. Remember, on Palm Sunday, as he was going, the people were rushing, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. They were expressing faith in Jesus as their earthly Messiah, not as their Savior. That's the difference. Jesus will find faith on the earth when he comes, but it will be rare. The lesson Jesus taught his disciples is the same for us today. We are to pray and not lose heart in a world where faith that pleases God is hard to find, especially amongst those who claim to be Christians. I'm working on a sermon called The Church of the Nine Lepers. The Church of the Nine Lepers is packed, air Sunday. Church of the Nine Lepers, I'll explain that at another time, but just know, Lord willing, that's coming. So we, in order to, to understand if there will be faith in the earth, the kind of faith Jesus is talking about, we must understand what is the definition of faith? What is it? Hebrews 11.1, 1, we've heard it over and over. The New American Standard Bible says it this way. Now faith is the, and I've added, God-given assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. You can't hope for godly things Unless God himself places the hope in you. You were saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. The grace nor the faith is of yourself, but it is the gift of God. Amen. Amen. It's the gift of God. The only reason you believe is because God had mercy upon you. And someone ought to say, thank you, Jesus. Faith is the gift of God that gives us assurance that every promise he has made to us will be fulfilled because of who he is and his faithfulness to his word. The question is this, what was the attitude of those in Hebrews chapter 11? There's an attitude that goes along with this assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. What is the attitude? Verse 7 of Hebrews 11. By faith, Noah 
being warned by God or hearing the word of God about things not yet seen. Faith is conviction of things what? Not seen. So by faith, Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen in reverence. What was the attitude? Reverence. In reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. How was Noah saved? By grace through faith. How were you saved? By grace through faith. How were people saved in the Old Testament? By grace through faith. How are people saved today? By grace to faith. Uh, grace through faith. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Noah, get this, Noah preserved himself and his family because he reverenced God or feared God, understanding he is to be obeyed, which is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning. You can't have wisdom unless you first, under, first understand, well, we, we best obey God. Because anything other than that is folly and foolishness. Everyone else was eating, drinking, giving your marriage, doing everything because they didn't have the fear of God. They didn't understand why. They didn't have the faith that Noah had. How did Noah get to faith? By grace. God, by his grace, gave Noah the faith so that he could understand the word of God. By faith, we understand that God is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It is the gift of faith. Are you thankful for that gift? gift this morning. Amen. These people didn't understand until the floods came and they were the flood came and they were all destroyed. Noah was convicted of things he nor anyone else at that time had ever seen. It never rained. It never rained. He thought about a rain is coming and going to the water is coming to destroy the earth. Ha! They do the same thing today. Jesus is coming again. Ha! We don't believe he came the first time. It's the same. But so why do you still, my question is, why do you still live a godly life? Because of faith. You are confident of things you have never seen. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. See that? Obeyed. Obeyed. By how? By going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. I tell you what, I want you all to follow me up to church. We're just going to go somewhere. <laughs> what are we going to eat? I don't know. How are we going to get stuff to drink? I don't know. <laughs> How many of us would do that? Mm -mm, you wouldn't follow me, but I sure enough will follow God. How about you? God-pleasing faith produces an attitude of submission to the commands of God. Faith submits. Faith submits to the will of God. Both Abraham and Noah believed what they could not see because they believed in the one who made the promise. What they could not see with their physical eyes, they saw with the eyes of faith. Faith sees. Say that with me. Faith sees. What does faith see? Verse 9. By faith, he, meaning Abraham, lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Verse 10. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. He could not see the children. He couldn't see what was, all he saw in front of him was dust and tents, dryness. But we walk by what? Faith, not by sight. To de re define that or refine that statement a little bit, we walk by, we walk not by sight, but by faith that sees. Faith sees the promise. The focus of Abraham's faith was not earthly riches and possessions, but an eternal home in the presence of God. He could see it. 
I remember there, are people, there have been those who are dying on that deathbed and they can see, they can see, they can feel the pull of heaven on them. And the only thing they care about is I'm ready to go. You could be standing right there and say, oh, no, don't go. I'm ready to go. Why? They see with the eyes of faith the promise that has kept them all their lives. And they're closer then to that when they've ever been to that promise of being with the Lord. So the attitude of faith is submission to the will of God. Verse 13. All these, all those mentioned earlier. And he was 11. I encourage you to go back and read it this afternoon. All these died in faith without receiving the promises. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, they were able to see it from a distance. And having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. My question for you this morning is what do you see in the distance? What do you see? Do you see the fear of tomorrow? the darkness of not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow? Or do you see the hope of heaven? Can you see that? My brothers and sisters, without that, we'll go around like chickens with our head cut off, going hither and yon. Just, just crazy. Can those, another question, can those who really know us Observe our lives and confirm our confession that we are strangers and exiles on the earth. Is, is that what those who really know us say about us? That, that's a peculiar one right there. Or would they say we love the world and the things in the world because of the, the love of the Father is not in us? We have to ask ourselves these questions because it doesn't matter what we confess what matters is what we possess. And if we possess the saving faith of Jesus Christ, the world will be able to see that we live as aliens in this world. We don't think the way they do. We don't love what they do. We don't go after what they do. And matter of fact, we don't care if they like us or not. Amen. The only one we want to please. And we want to hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Welcome into the kingdom I prepared for you before. For the foundation of the world. That's what I, and I know that's what you want to hear. Verse 14. For those who say such things that we are exiles, strangers on the earth, make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. Verse 15. And if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. In other words, we were saved by grace through faith. Faith took us out of the Egypt of our existence. And if we wanted to go back, we would look that way. You see, in, in, in uh, Lot, Lot's wife, in Sodom and Gomorrah, the angel said, do you, know that, do you know that Lot didn't leave voluntarily? He didn't leave voluntarily. The angel had to grab him and say, get up out of here. Did you know that? The, he didn't go walking up, call, bless God, bless God, and we'll be, I'm marching to Zion. No. The angel had to yank him up out of there. He was just as guilty as his wife. He didn't want to go. And then he started making excuses. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, what if I just go over here? What does that teach us? It teaches us about the grace of God that even in our stubbornness, he will never let us go. What a great God we serve. And so then, but his wife turned back. And so they say she turned into a pillar of stone. You know, I, I used to think of it as something like an I dream of genie. Bing, and all of a sudden she's, no. If you go to the area where the destruction was, there's a bunch of salt and all. It's just, just devastation. In other words, she became a 
part of the destruction that happened there. If a building falls down on somebody, it's, you, they become a part of that destruction. She was a part of the destruction because she turned around and wanted to go back. But praise God, we are not going back. Why? Because we belong to the Savior. We belong to the shepherd of our souls. And a stranger, we will not follow. The old saints used to sing, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Remember, you know, this ain't my home. Now today they sing, this world is my treasured home, and I'm going to stay here whatever I do. And I hope I'm better off than you. That's the second verse. <laughs> that's, that's what they sing today. Verse 16. But as it is, they desire, who's they? All those in Hebrews 11, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Amen. Even back in the Old Testament, they were desiring a heavenly country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. I don't know about you, but I want to stay heavenly minded so God will not be ashamed to be called my God. How about you? Though God is looking for the faith that's looking for him, not the stuff. The stuff is consequential. When you serve God, he will supply all of your needs. It may get a little tight sometimes. It may get a little rough sometimes. But what does faith do? Faith causes you to do the things you would not do so that you can glorify God in whatever you do so that you can have everything you need whenever you need it. That's faith. Oh, you don't have enough faith. You, 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 you need money. You need more faith. No, you need to get your hips out in front of the TV and go out and get some work done. Amen. Amen. That's another sermon. That's like going in. The, I say this all the time. That's like going up in the woods in the middle of February. It's cold. And you've been dropped off in a shed. And it's cold up in there. You can see your breath as it comes out. And, and you're there with a couple of friends and, and you just say, well, let's pray. And so you spend all night praying and then you freeze. Lord God, provide for us. Well, you pray that. And then you notice the ax in the corner. Then you notice the wood outside. And you see all the little bunnies running around in the deer. <laughs> there goes dinner. And then you, chop, you, you get a little... And you work at it, you got the fire, and guess what? There's a wood-burning stove in the middle of that old shack there. God has provided everything you need, just like he told Israel, the land is yours, now go get it. That's faith, amen. Faith is not sitting around some, some, some old quack and some hack saying, if you send your money to me, God is going to fill your bank account this week. They're all over TV. <laughs> So are we living in a way where God is, looks at that, look at him, look, look at mine, look, look at him, look at him, look at her. Faith that desires heaven above all this world offers is built upon the foundation of faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those who have true faith are looking forward to looking forward to a city whose builder and his architect is God, but it's based upon the resurrection. Verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. Verse 18, it was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. Ishmael was around, but Isaac was the only begotten of faith. Remember, God said, you're going to bear a son. Sarah couldn't have children, but God opened her womb so she was able to have it. Isaac was the son of the promise, and there was never going to be another Isaac. And God told him, now go, go and sacrifice this one. But he went and did it. Why? Verse 19. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. He believed that if God made a promise, I can kill this boy and God will bring him back. Oh, guess what? There was a ram in the thicket 
And so the innocent was killed for the sins of the guilty. That ram represented Jesus Christ. And Isaac represented Christ who was raised from the dead. It says he received him back as a type. Isaac was a type of Christ. He wasn't Christ. He was a type. But God was showing him because of your faith in the resurrection, I'm going to restore all things and give you everything I have promised. How were you saying? You believe that Jesus Christ was raised what? From the dead. Oh, uh, somebody help me here. You believe that he was raised from what? Yeah. Same thing in the Old Testament. He believed it. Verse 39 says, and all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Verse 40, because God had provided something better for us, not them, us, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. What does that mean? What does that mean? Our loved ones who have died in the Lord having gained approval for their faith, have not yet received what was promised. They haven't received it. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Yes, that has been fulfilled. But they have not received the promise yet. Because God is going to make sure we all get it at the same time. You ever remember they give out gifts or something to say, everybody wait till it's all handed out. Okay, now go. People start tearing into the gift. Something, there's this excitement about when a group does something at the same time. It's going to be the same way on that great getting up morning. Aren't you excited about that? I'm going to get mine exactly when you get yours. <laughs> so what are we going to get? I'm winding up here. And what, is he, what are we going to get? What is the promise? Romans 8, 23 through 25. And I don't know, not only this, but we also ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit. What are the first fruits? A spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, and the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. That's the first fruit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves waiting for our what? Adoption as sons. What is that? The redemption of our body. Abraham is in the presence of the Lord, but not in the body he's going to have. Isaac is in the presence of the Lord. Your loved ones, our loved ones who have gone on, they are in the presence of the Lord, but they are like the souls underneath the, the altar crying, how long, how long? But they're not going to stay souls like that forever. Why? When the trump of God shall sound, the dead in Christ will rise first. What? does that mean? It means those souls will be joined with a new redemptive body and those of us who remain will be joined together with them. But what about us? In the moment, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed and together we will meet him in the air to dwell with the Lord forever not as disembodied souls but in brand new bodies in the body of Christ in the likeness of Christ and we will be called the children of God forever and ever and we will eat from the 12 leaves of the tree of life and we will drink from the river of water and we will glorify God forever what a day that's going to be what a day that's going to be Oh, yes, sir. What a day that's going to be. Will Jesus find faith in the earth when he returns? Yes, he will. But it's sure enough going to be scarce. Can you find it? Walk out here and try to find God pleasing in faith. Can you find it? It's hard, especially some, with some of your Christian friends. You start talking about like this. They're looking at you at you crazy. What you learn about a church? Well, that God promised I'm going to have health, wealth, and everything I want. Eh, wrong wrong. That's not it. God has promised you a kingdom. He's promised you He's promised you that you're going to be a joint heir with Christ. What about that? When I used to travel a lot for music or when I would do, before that I would travel with, with my work. Whenever I went somewhere, I did not bring back stuff for Robert and Jennifer. I didn't want them to look at my hand when I got home. 
I wanted them to look at me when I got home. So what did I do? I said, come on, guys. Daddy's home. We're going to McDonald's. <laughs> and they looked forward to that because they were going to do something with daddy. But most Christians are looking at his hand and don't care about seeing his face. I know I'm preaching good this morning. I'm preaching the truth this morning. Yes, I am. Have you ever had a conversation with someone whose body has been redeemed? Have you ever had a conversation with someone whose body has been redeemed? No, their body, not their spirit, their body. No, no, because it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened. Then why are you so confident that something you have never seen or experienced will happen? It's because your God given faith in the one who made the promise causes you to believe. Amen. You've never seen it. You ever see someone get up out of a grave? I've never seen it. Have you had a, You've never seen it. But you're confident in it, aren't you, this morning? And when we sing about it and we talk about it, we get a little excited more than any other subject. You start talking about going to heaven. People start getting a little happy if they got any Holy Ghost in them. Verse 24, for in this hope we have been saved. What hope? Waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. But hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? We are we still hoping for it. Those who have true faith in God are looking forward to the second coming of Christ. And we live a life that reflects that hope. How does that life look? We obey God. We offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy, pleasing, and acceptable to God. For this is our spiritual act of worship. That's what it is. Though we have not physically received all God has promised, we know that we already have it. Verse 25. But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, meaning assured of things hoped for and convicted of things not seen, we eagerly, we wait eagerly for it. What does that mean? Looking for and eagerly desiring desiring the coming of the day of God. <laughs> That's the faith that pleases God. Yes, we pray for God to heal our bodies. And sometimes God does and sometimes he doesn't. It's not because you have a lack of faith. It's because God plans something better for all of us at the same time. Can someone say amen? amen? It's not about me. My faith is not about me. Your faith is not about you. Our faith is hope in Jesus Christ who's going to restore all things the way he intends it to be restored. And we will live with him forever. Oh my Lord. We're going to see him face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face what will it be? When in rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ who died for me. Now that faith will get you through the hospital bed. That faith will get you up in the morning when you don't feel like getting up. Why? Because you know he who holds the future is holding you. And you can get up every morning and say, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Here's the good part. All I have needed, thy hands have provided. Everything. Great is thy faithfulness. To me. Doesn't that give you peace? Don't you sense the peace of God right now? Because you're thinking about him, not your circumstance. This week I encourage you to keep your eyes fixed on things above. Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. 
where he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and we are already there with him. The reality of our resurrection is already complete. We are already there with him. So praise him this week, during this holy week. Live as if, you know, people say holy week. Every week is holy. Every week is holy because we have been separated for God's use. So this week, I pray that you're so heavenly minded that people can see just how earthly good you are. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, we praise you and honor you. We thank you for your rich word that encourages us to look up. Some trust in chariots, chariot, some trust in horses. We will trust in the name of the Lord. We thank you, Father, that we are your children. And the latter days will be greater than the former. That we can look forward to that great day when we see you. And that hope causes us to live righteously now, now. Not for the applause of men, but for your glory. Lord God, strengthen us to that end, and by your Holy Spirit we pray. In Jesus' name, and all who love the Lord said, Amen. Amen.